It is our privilege and our joy today to have Dr. Wave Nunnerly. God bless you, doctor. Let's give him a good welcome this morning. Amen. Now I think I'm on. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys, in the back for helping me out. I couldn't do it without it. I, I'm, I think I was born in the right generation. Uh, I got to have a PA and I got to have projection. I got to have a laser pointer, too. That helps. Praise God for Chinese technology. <laughs> Illegal Chinese technology. <laughs> it works. It works outside even in the sunshine, which is where we'll be uh, most of the time when we're studying together in Israel. I'm, sh I'm sure I will see you there in February. Just got back um, and uh, had a wonderful trip with uh, uh, pastors and their husbands and wives from Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, and Pastor Jim Bradford, and we were there in February, and the weather was glorious. Uh, and you didn't have to worry about getting dehydrated. Everything was green and beautiful um, in Israel. Uh, it was a great break from the Midwest for everybody that came because the temperatures were nice. And uh, we had an awesome time. But we're going to do that for you guys next February, so don't feel like you've been left out. And I'm not just telling stories to make you, make you salivate. This morning, we're going to talk about uh, Jesus' um, uh, words of light of the world. You, you know about that, right? Uh, let me, because I'm a professor, I get to do this. It's totally legal. Just don't feel like you're uh, being uh, infringed. Your personal space is being fringed, infringed on at all. I have a license for this, but here's a, a little pop quiz. Um, in, the, in the Bible, where do the um, phrases, the, the phrase, where does the phrase light of the world show up? John twice. John 8 and John 9. We'll look at it in just a minute. I'm looking for one more book. Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll look at that as well. So please don't feel like that you have to follow the bouncing ball, taking notes and stuff like that. They will put this on the website, and you can download it, including the incredible pictures that you're going to be seeing at the end. Because what we're going to do today in Sunday school, this is legal because it's Sunday school, this is a time of serious study, is we're going to get out of the kiddie pool because we know what they do in that kiddie pool. And we're going to dive in on the deep end of the pool. Are you okay with that? So with your seatbelt fastened and your tray in its upright and locked position, I want to make sure that you dial in on this material. It's going to be text at the beginning, Bible and stuff outside the Bible, and then toward the end it's going to be the beautiful pictures, so I'll leave you with a nice taste in your mouth. But it's important to follow this. Um, it's, it's time to drill down. Sometimes, you know, like at the end of the meal, it's nice to get the piece of pie with the meringue, you know. Um, it's nice to get that, you know, that sweet taste of that little, you know, piece of candy that you get right before you leave the restaurant. But right now it's meat and potatoes time. Are you ready for this? So thank you, pastors, for giving, giving me the opportunity. I'm blessed to be here in the name of Evangel, Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, and the Center for Holy Land Studies, and your pastoral staff. So, uh, Jesus, light of the world, sayings in context. Next. In the Gospel of John, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the, say it with me, light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Next text. While I am the world, and in the world, Jesus says in John 9, I am the light of the world. So Jesus, I am the light of the world. Next slide. In the uh, book, Gospel of John, where we're getting this stuff from, I am the light of the world two different times, John develops a lot of really important themes. The, th the theme of sentness, S I made that up, S-E-N-T-N-E-S-S, -S. sentness. S okay, sentism, if you like, scentedness, okay? Um, he develops the theme of light versus darkness. Um, he is a person who develops theological themes. I get that. But when more liberal approach 
comes in this direction and says, okay, well then when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, that's simply John developing a theological theme. That can't be traced back to the original, genuine, historical Jesus. That's something John just puts in his, on his lips to develop his theme of light and light versus darkness. My question is, will that position that is regularly held by people from the middle to the extreme left of New Testament scholarship, and by the way, yes, taught in your local colleges and in their textbooks, does that really hold up under closer scrutiny? In other words, when you look at all the evidence available, is it more likely that Jesus said this or that John made it up and put it in his mouth? Don't pretend that you haven't heard this before because it's all over the place on TV. I'm not talking about Christian TV, Discovery Channel, History Channel, ABC, NBC, CBS. Anytime it comes Christmas or Easter, which we've just observed, you're going to get these documentaries, these specials on the historical Jesus. You've seen some of them already. Uh, I'm just taking this morning to push back a little bit on that. Uh, next passage. Um, in the book of Genesis, this is Jesus' Bible, the beginning of Jesus' Bible. Jesus reads about Abraham that God tells him, in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So yes, Israel is specially chosen and has a special place in God's economy, in his plan to redeem a people for himself. But even when God places his hand on Abraham and chooses Abraham, look at what the ultimate goal is, that all the families of the earth be blessed through Abraham. So he's not simply dialed in on Abraham alone. He's using Abraham as a means, Abraham as a method, as a, Abraham as a conduit to bring blessing to all the families of the earth. I wonder, would that include yours or mine? Or your neighbors? Yes. Next. This is still reading Jesus' Bible. We're asking the question, did Jesus say these words or did John make them up and put them in his mouth? Behold my servant, Isaiah says, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. These are part of the servant songs that Jesus identified as referring to himself. The servant songs of Isaiah. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice, ooh, to the nations. Remember, light of the world. Keep going. I think we're on to something. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he's established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Next. Thus says the Lord God, still Isaiah, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The whole earth all belongs, and we who dwell therein. This is the God who owns us all by right of creation and who gives breath to the people and spirit to those who walk in it. God's not just concerned about Abraham or Abraham's seed. Next, Isaiah again, I will appoint you as a covenant to the people as a light to the, see the plural there? A light to the world. Hmm. Did John make that up? Or did Isaiah make that up? And Jesus read it and co-opted it and applied it to himself. You see how this works? Okay, next. Isaiah 49. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. Israel is not enough. I will also make you, oh, a light of the nations. So we get it in Isaiah 42, and we get it in Isaiah 49. By the way, when Jesus identifies himself, he says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, etc. Where is he getting that from? Isaiah, exactly. This is Jesus channeling Isaiah. You're re making reference his self-identity. He's pulling that out of the book of Isaiah. He is that light to the nations, so that my salvation might reach the ends of the earth. Isn't that awesome? Not just Abraham, not just Jesus. He's interested in salvation reaching you. 
your friends and your relatives and your neighbors and your co-workers, that's the end of the earth. And that light is supposed to reach the whole world. Doing the math on this, right? Especially young people. Come on, you got young brains. There's more than just two or three brain cells just holding hands right at the fingertips like some of us. Next. This is going to be a long text. I'll apologize ahead of time, but this is really cool, and unless you download this off of the church's website, this will be the only time you ever see this text in the history of your miserable life. Okay? All right? So, let's, let's focus. Remember Karate Kid, part one, two, three, four, and I think we're up to about five. Focus. Long text, not in the Bible, but this is from early, the teachings of the early rabbis. Next. Who are they? Herod the Great said. Now, boom, Herod the Great, that, that anchors this text in the first century B.C., early first century A.D., because Herod the Great died in the spring of 4 B.C., okay? Right at the time of the birth of Jesus. Who are they, said Herod the Great, who teach from the midst of your brethren, meaning Jews, Israelites, you shall set a king up over you? Who focuses on that passage from Deuteronomy 17? Who is it that teach that? The rabbis. So he arose and killed all the rabbis, but spared Baba ben Buta, who was like one of the top dog rabbis of the first century B.C., so that he might take counsel of him. And Bava ben Buta becomes one of the closest advisors of this evil king that we call Herod the Great. He placed on Bava ben Buta's head a garland of hedgehog bristles. Do you, you hear this in the New Testament, don't you? Who was it that wore a crown of thorns? Okay, so this is not new. This is, this is attested in, script, in, in ancient passages outside the Scripture before the time of Jesus, that, they, that people were mistreated in this kind of way. That's interesting. That's, a, that's the, for the, worth the price of Sunday school right there. Somebody said, Amen. or oh me, your call. Um, a, a garland of hedgehog bristles and put out his eyes, made him blind. Next, uh, con this text continues. I just couldn't get it all on one text. A one slide. One day Herod came and sat down before Baba ben Buta and said, See, sir, now he can't see, right? But he's saying, See, sir, do you get the irony? Put his eyes out and then, See, sir, what this wicked slave does. He's talking about himself. What do you want me to do? He replied. He said, I want you to curse this wicked slave. Herod wants to see what Baba ben Buta is going to say. So he disguises himself, speaks with another accent so that he can't recognize him as being the, the, the Herod that we've all come to know and hate, love, whatever. Uh, he replied, he said, I want you to curse him. But, but Baba ben Buta said, even in your thoughts you shouldn't curse a king. See, even blind and with hedgehog bristles on his head, he knows the Bible. So he quotes a passage from the Bible, says, no, sorry, I can't do that. The Bible says, don't curse the king. Herod said to him, but this is no king. He replied, even though he only be a rich man, it's written, and in your bedtime, do not curse the rich. You've got another Bible passage that covers that as well. The, and uh, even though he be no more than a prince, it is written, a prince among your people you shall not curse. He's got another Bible passage. This guy knows the Bible. Have you ever noticed this? This guy is blind, but he knows the Bible. You ever see a passage in the New Testament where people come up to Jesus and ask him a question or they accost him about some practice that he's healing on the Sabbath or some kind of ritual purity issue, and Jesus then whips out his uh, pocket New Testament Gideon scroll, and he rolls in. Hang on just a second. Let me find my place. Um, I know it's in here somewhere. I underlined it last week. Oh, yeah, here it is. No, he knows the Bible by heart. This world that we're dealing with in Jesus' day is an unbelievably literate, biblically literate world. 
That should give a little challenge or encouragement or whatever. If you got a verse a day or a verse a week or whatever that you're memorizing, you're walking in a proud tradition of a people who were so biblically literate that Jesus only had to say a word or two and, he, and everybody knew exactly what he was talking about. Read some of the articles that I've written at penews.org, enrichmentjournal.ag.org or whatever and you'll see that we track this stuff in the New Testament that Jesus teaches. So, don't curse the rich, don't curse the prince, don't curse the king. Herod said to him, if this applies, this applies only to one who acts like one of your people. He's still baiting him. He's tr still trying to trap Baba Ben Buddha in his words to see if he was loyal or not. I wouldn't have been if he poked my eyes out. So he, Herod's testing him. Herod said, this only applies to one who acts like one of your people, but this man doesn't act like one of your people. And this B Baba Ben Buddha said, okay, I'm, I'm out of Bible verses. Let me just tell you this. I'm scared of the guy. How does that work for you? I'm afraid of him, which Herod loved. He isn't interested in people loving him. He wanted them to fear him. So he said, I am afraid of him. Next slide. But Herod said, there's no one who can go and tell him, we're all alone here. Baba Ben Buddha said, but a bird from the heavens will carry the voice, and what has wings will tell the matter. He's got another Bible passage. You thought he was done. Herod said, you know what? I give up. I am Herod. And if I had only known that the rabbis were this careful in the way that they speak, even about me, then I would not have killed them. So now I'm feeling guilty about killing the rabbis. What should I do to make amends? This is what Baba Ben Buddha says. You have, since you have extinguished the, bam, there it is, right there in first century B.C. So Jesus just made this up, didn't he? Or John, the apostle, the gospel writer, he just made that stuff up and put those words in Jesus' mouth. No, one of the greatest sages, one of the greatest rabbis of all time in the previous generation was already talking like this. Since you've extinguished the light of the world, what, what is Baba saying there? Herod, since you killed the rabbis, then, okay, so Baba is saying that the rabbis are the light of the world. When Jesus says that, then what is he saying? The rabbis were the authoritative interpreters and appliers of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. So Jesus is placing himself in this position of authority. He is superseding. He is the one. He's, I'm the top dog rabbi. I'm the one who has the right, the authority, to interpret Scripture and apply it to your life. My question is, is that, where, is that the place that Jesus applies, uh, uh, occupies in your life today? Is he the arbiter? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible mean? What does the, how is the Bible applied to my everyday life? He said, for since you extinguish the light of the world, for so the rabbis are called, because it's written, the commandment is a light, and the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, book of, books of Moses, is a lamp. Now, here's another passage and another rabbinic text. The Torah is the light of the world. So now we have another light of the world. The Torah is, the light of the world is the rabbis, the authoritative interpreters of Scripture. I told it was going to get deep. Are you, are you over your head already? Come up for air, because this is where it gets really good. The rabbis are the light of the world. Now this text is saying the Torah, the Bible, the Scriptures, the Word of God is the light of the world. Are you following this? The rabbis, now the Torah. Next. I want you to go and I want you to attend to the light of the world, which is the temple of which it is written, and all the nations shall become enlightened by it. And we have all kinds of passages from the teachings of the rabbis, like um, the temple 
constructed in a way to draw light out into the world or let the light of the temple out into the world or the, from uh, the place of the house of the sanctuary, light went forth into the world. There's stuff all over rabbinic literature that identifies the temple as the light of the world. So which is it? The light of the world to pre-Christian before Jesus and John the Baptist, Paul and all these other guys ever show up what is the light of the world to the first century B.C., first century A.D. Jew? I know it's an unfair question, but it has three answers, and it's not God, Jesus, and the Bible, okay? So it's the rabbis, it's the Bible, and it's the temple, okay? So when Jesus comes along, what does he say? When he says, I am the light of the world, he says, I am the authoritative interpretation and application. I am also the embodiment of the Word of God. I, re I am the Word of God. What does John chapter 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Jesus is saying, I am the culmination of this whole rabbinic movement that, that, in, that memorizes interprets and applies the Word of God. I am the authoritative interpreter. I am the embodiment of the Word of God. And then when you get to the temple is the light of the world, the temple represents what? The dwelling presence of God. So Jesus is saying, I am the literal dwelling presence of God. He who has seen me, somebody help me with this, has seen the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And so I say nothing, I do nothing except what I see the Father doing and saying. I and the Father are one, okay? So Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. In his day, people already understood this to mean three things. When you said light of the world, this goes back to Genesis 12, goes all the way through the servant songs in Isaiah, comes all the way up through the way that the rabbis are using that phrase light of the world, and he's saying, I am the dwelling presence of God. I am the embodiment of the Word of God, and I am the true interpreter and applier of the Word of God to your everyday lives. Did uh, John make those words up, I am the light of the world, not even close. This stuff goes back a generation at least before John ever came into this world and became then later a follower of Jesus and ultimately a writer of your fourth gospel. This is really fun, cool stuff. Are you enjoying the deep end of the pool? Do you want to launch out a little bit further? Why not? We've got how many minutes? Yeah, no, but when do we end? It's 10 after, is that right? Oh, I'll be here for second service. Let not your heart be troubled. I'll continue to afflict you. <laughs> 10 after, is that right? We can do this. Let's, uh, let's continue. Jesus does not stop there. He never does. He didn't come here just to impress people. He came here to change people. Come on. He came here to get up in your grill, up in your Kool-Aid. He came to get right into your life, and that he will never stop until he does that. So then, do uh, you remember this interesting little passage in the Gospel of John? As the Father has sent me, so do I send you. I want you to keep that in mind. Is Jesus a one-man army? No, he's the leader. He's the captain of the Lord's army. Well, then who's the army? You. Me, us, I lived in Cincinnati for six years, so I, it's legal for me to say that. Us-uns, we-uns, you-uns. I grew up in the South, so I can say this legally too. I've got the card to prove it. Y'all, yeah? All right, so you are the light of the world. You, did you notice that the pronoun changed? And John, it's I am the light of the world. In the Gospel of Matthew, this is at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the most important sermon, including this one, uh, <laughs> ever preached. This is Jesus giving his marching orders to his new community, okay? John chapter, uh, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Here it's at the beginning of that three chapter long sermon, longest sermon that we have recorded that Jesus gave. 
is another sermon we talked about in first service that we'll talk about again in second service, where basically he preaches the sermon in one sentence. He says, truly I say unto you today, that scripture that I just read is being fulfilled in your hearing. End, altar call. Uh, but this is the longest. Uh, he says, at the beginning, you are the light of the world. And then he says, he's trying to explain what exactly does that mean? How does that function? How does your life function as the light of the world? He says, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. It's an interesting way of explaining it because in Abraham's day, in David's day, in King Hezekiah's day, cities that were built were walled cities that were built on hills, but in Jesus' day, they weren't. A lot of water has gone over the dam, under the bridge between Abraham and David and Isaiah, Hezekiah. By the way, we're talking about all those guys tonight. The most important archaeological discoveries of the last year, and they have been mind-blowing. One after another after another we'll look at, but that's for another time uh, tonight. Um, but in Jesus' day, you'd had the, the conquest of Alexander the Great. You remember that from Western Civ, world history, right? 333 BC, Alexander begins to conquer the known world, and cities move down off of the mountains down onto the flat area that was just below the mountain. Can you say too big to fail? The Romans come along after the Greeks, and they have the same attitude, too big to fail. So they're not building walled cities on top of high mountains. They're building down on the plain. Here's a question. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, where was he? He was in, the, he was in Israel, he was in Galilee, and he was a, somewhere around the Sea of Galilee. Context is important. That's the, way, that's the reason you and I are going to study this stuff in 3D, 5D, high resolution, true color. You know, it's 600 and, what was, 760 pixels or whatever. That's the reason you and I have a date this coming February in the land of Israel, is because context, as Pastor Don said, context matters. So when Jesus is giving this sermon on the mount, around the Sea of Galilee, and he's talking about a city set on a hill. I want you to keep that in mind because there's only one that he can be referring to. Next slide. In the material from the rabbis, just as the light of the stars can be seen from one end of the world to the other, so the light of the righteous. So it's not just about God. This light business has something to do with describing the people of God those who are committed to serving him and obeying his word. Um, if Israel does the will of the Lord, they're like the stars. In other words, if you obey God, you're the light of the world. Just do the math. That's all you got to do. You function as the light of the world. As God is the light of the world, if you obey him, it's like Jesus said, you are the, I'm the light of the world, you are the light of the world. Next slide. Rabbi Oshia said in the name of Rabbi Ephes, in the future, Jerusalem will be a torch, and elsewhere, this same language of the light refers to Israel's leaders, Moses, the Maccabees, uh, etc. For the nations, and they will walk by her light. Why is that? The nations will go by your light. They're quoting from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3. Next. I know long text again. I apologize. This is the last time I'll apologize because this is the last long text. Right? Rabbi Acha said, Israel can be compared to an olive. Why is that? Because olives give what kind of oil? Yeah, Popeye, <laughs> olive oil. Okay, Israel provides olive oil, a leafy olive tree. So you have a Bible passage. The Holy One, blessed be He, is compared to a lamp. So you put a lamp together with olive oil, and what do you get? Light. Exactly. Now, is that only God, or is that only Israel? Is that only the lamp, or only the olive oil? No, it's a both and. This is what Jesus is doing. 
He's clearly said, I am the light of the world. No doubt about it. I'm the authoritative interpreter. I'm the authoritative text. And I am the authoritative presence of God. He said that about himself. But he's not like one who just won't share his glory. He wants to get people, the people of the covenant, the people who have been redeemed by God, who have been transformed by God, who are obeying God, that will then reflect that glory, that light of God, and they then become light themselves because they're doing the will of, they're working in conjunction with God the Father, God the Creator, the source of light. So, the lamp of God, they quote from Proverbs, the lamp of God is the soul of man. They found a Bible passage that says the two work together to be light to the world. It's not just God alone, it's God incorporating us, the oil, into him, the lamp, that then shines to all mankind. Just as the, it is the way to put oil into a lamp and then the two of them, both the oil and the lamp, give light together. So said the Holy One, blessed he to Israel, my children, since my light is your light and your light is my light, let us both, you and I, go and give light to Zion. And then they quote the Bible again, arise and shine because your light has come and the glory is of, uh, of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise on you and his glory will be seen upon you. That's what people need to see. God's not hiding in a temple somewhere. God is manifesting his glory, his light, his presence, his deliverance, his provision, his salvation through you to the earth. Friends, family, co-workers, people you run into at Walmart or whatever, you are, have become a part of God's shining his glory into the earth. My children, since your, my light is your light and your light is my light, let us both, you and I, go and give glory. Uh, your light will be coming from the Lord who is your everlasting light. And again, it keeps circling back to Isaiah 60. The rabbis and Jesus keep circling back to those latter chapters in the prophecy of, uh, your turn. The prophecy of Isaiah, exactly. Everybody's quoting, everybody's coming back to and rooting their teaching, Jesus and the rabbis, in those ancient texts of Isaiah. Next. Now we get to the fun part. In the land of Israel, there is a sea in the northern part. It's named because of the because of the, the uh, district that it's connected to. It's called the Sea of Galilee, right. Here's the Sea of Galilee. You're looking from the west to the east. You will be seeing this in person in February. Thank you very much. Praise the name of your pastoral staff. There is one city that is set on a hill. It's not Capernaum, it's on flat land. It's not Gennesaret, flat land. It's not Magdala, which we studied in the first service and we're gonna study in the second service because it's built on flat land. Remember, all those cities are built after the Greek conquest and Roman occupation and Greeks and Romans are building cities on the flat land. But there's one city. This is one of the Decapolis cities, by the way. It is spoken of in Greek and Roman sources one of those 10 great cities on the east side of the Jordan River and on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. This city is called in Latin and in Greek, Hippos, Hippos. You know the word hippopotamus, it means horse of the river, Hippopotamus, Hi horse of the river. So Hippo, Hippos, means horse. A hippodrome means a place where you race horses, all right? So, this city is called Hippos, but in Hebrew is called Susita because Hippos in Hebrew, horse in Hebrew is Sus or Susita. So this is Susita in Hebrew, Hippos in Greek and Latin. This city is a city that is set on a hill. Up here, Golan Heights. You've heard of it in the news. 
It goes behind Hippus. Hippus is cut off from the Golan Heights by two drainage systems that have, over the centuries, eroded the land to the point where Hippus has become an island uh, uh, on, on land. It is a city that's set on a hill. Think back in Jesus' day when this city was in all of its glory, built up again about another hundred feet higher would have been great civic buildings, theaters, banks, temples, and that sort of thing. Next slide. Uh, here's another slide just in, in a different uh, resolution, and you can see how people came up Hippus. They're going up to the city set on a hill, Golan Heights behind. Here's Kibbutz Ein Gev right in the foreground and the Sea of Galilee right there. Next. Here's we're up on top of Hippus, and you can see these gigantic marble columns, and Israel has no marble, so these are imported from places like Egypt. Beautiful marble and granite columns that supported gigantic buildings that rose up above, and the Sea of Galilee is right behind us, rose up another 100, 150 feet in the air. You see uh, city streets like this. Next slide. Uh, again, more of these gigantic marble and granite columns. Beautiful. Sea of Galilee in the background for those of you who have already been there once or twice. On top of Hippos, you can see Mount Tabor right there. That's all the way over by Nazareth where Jesus was raised. Incredible, yeah? Would you like to hike to the top of Susita, Hippos? No? How would you like to go the back door by the autobus? Can you translate? Gil and I can make this happen. We have friends in high places. They say in Israel, pray a lot. It's a local call. Next slide. Okay, now we are up on top of Hippos for a very important purpose. We are watching the setting of the sun in the west. It always sets in the west. Did you ever notice that? Okay. So this is Israel proper over here. This is Galilee. We're looking across at the city of Tiberias that we talked about in first and we will talk about in second service. We're on top of Hippos Susita. We're on top of this city set on a hill, the only one that can be seen from the, around, the, uh, around the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias, it's built right on flat ground, not on a hill. Uh, because it's a New Testament site, not an ancient Old Testament site. Next slide. Now we're seeing the sun go down even further. Look at this paved street. This is original first century type stuff, ladies and gentlemen, and you get to walk on them. Again, when we go to Israel, my goal is not that you just walk where Jesus walked, but you come back walking like Jesus walked. Okay, 1 John chapter 2. Next slide. Okay, now the sun is all but gone. Do you see these capitals rising up? Well, there would be a roof on top of that, and then there would be arches that would go up another 50, 60 feet in the air. And the sun in the west is shining as it sets on those capitals, on those gigantic public buildings, and reflecting off in a beautiful display that is referred to by people in ancient times. Next slide. Here's the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. We're still on Hippos, and there's Tabor getting ready to tell you good night. Next. There's the slope of Sus Susita Hippos and Ein Gev and the lights of Ein Gev, the kibbutz right below, Sea of Galilee down at the bottom. Wouldn't it have been neat to grow up here? Wouldn't it have been neat to have this as your kind of the last thing that you saw uh, before darkness settled in. Wouldn't it be neat to have lived there? Wouldn't it be neat to walk there? Huh. February. <laughs> Next slide. Here's, one of, here's, our, here, here's where geography and ancient text collide. They coincide and add texture to, context to, passages we read in our New Testament. Rabbi Ami, who uh, uh, lives in the land of Israel and, and, and ministers in Galilee. Rabbi Ami commit, permitted the carrying of materials like the knife for the purpose of circumcision on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to carry stuff on the Sabbath because it's a day of rest. Carrying a knife would constitute bearing a load. That would constitute work. You're not supposed to do that. But 
you have to do that when the Bible says on the eighth day you circumcise. So if you happen to have been born uh, on a Sabbath, you have to be circumcised eight days later on the next Sabbath. You have to, in other words, break the Sabbath to keep the law of circumcision. One overrides the other. On the, he, you can do this on the evidence of women, the midwives who had witnessed the birth, who testified that when the child was born, the sun light was still shining on the village of Susita Hippus. What are people doing in the first century? People are setting their watches by the sun's rays setting at the very end of the day when it's dark down on the Sea of Galilee and dark in Capernaum and dark in Magdala and dark in Tiberias and dark in Gennesaret and dark in uh, Gergesa, G Gadarene demoniac, but you can still see the sunlight that is shining because it's a city set on a hill, the light coming from the hill. If that baby the week before was born when you could still see the sunlight reflecting off of those public buildings on the top of Susita, the city set on a hill, then that baby should be circumcised on the Sabbath and you should be able to break the Sabbath by carrying the knife and the linen garments and whatever accoutrements were needed for that circumcision. Next text. The cities in the vicinity of Susita, that is the, the produce of which is subject to tithing, it's 10% of all your flocks and fields and herds and the like. In other words, religious practice is being determined by location of Susita. All these towns that are Jewish towns and they're growing produce need to tithe that produce because they're that close to Susita. Distance is being determined. People are kind of using Susita in this passage. I don't know the names of these towns, do you? Most of them don't show up in the Bible. So what do you do? Oh, well, you know, Urbandale is, is close to Des Moines. Yeah? It's a big city close to smaller cities. People are giving directions on the basis of Susita. It's a well-known place. One of the great cities of the Decapolis, the city set on a, um, yes, next. Rabbi Judah said, if two went out to bear witness that they'd seen the new moon, uh, then they went out from a certain city where the majority are non-Jews like Susita. They're describing other towns as being somewhat similar to the demographics, the kind of people living there, Jews and Gentiles living together like this Susita. So cities are being described in comparison to. Next, seventh year produce is permitted if sold, for, uh, uh, sold if it comes from abroad. Rabbi Yossi says, um, uh, for instance, Ro Ro Rodkia, which they go and sell between Susita and Tiberias. They're describing a chunk of land between two major cities. The southern end of the Sea of Galilee is the area that lies between Susita and Tiberias. They're describing districts by this. Next. Halamish is hostile to Nave, Jericho to Naaran, Susita to Tiberias. And so they're saying these are the cities that are in competition with one another, one being Greek, the other being Jewish. At this point in time, Tiberias is almost all Jewish, Susita is almost all Gentile. They're talking about these cities are in competition. Minneapolis, St. Paul, right? East St. Louis, regular St. Louis. There you go, Urbandale and Johnston. Accordingly, it is written, listen to this text. This is Jerusalem, and I've set her in the midst of the nations in Ezekiel 5.5. 5. Why is that? Ezekiel saying Jerusalem is supposed to be the light to the nations. We're right back to that idea. Next. Rabbi Nehemiah said, Noah tied wild oxen to the ark. And how did the ark move? This is kind of interesting. It's not in the Bible. But he said he, he tied wild oxen and they swam and pulled the ark. 
Well, how far did they pull the ark? As far as from as Tiberius to Susita. Again, you're marking distance. You're marking time. You're marking religious practice. You're marking a cultural, uh, uh, agricultural produce and stuff with this reference to Susita. Next. Phineas said the ark floated on the water as far as, uh, upon two planks that were as big as Tiberius to Susita. They're using Tiberius and Susita as a means of measurement. So then, next, what is the moral of the story? What Jesus is saying when he says, you are the light of the world. He's saying people should set their clocks, should set their watches by your life. He's saying people should gauge their religious practice by your life. He's saying people should use as, as, as a means of measurement your life. Why is that? Because if, you, if I'm the light of the world and you are reflecting that light to everybody around you, your lives should be lived in such a manner that your covenant faithfulness shines like a light out into the nations. And they should be able to mark time. They should be able to set their watch by your covenant faithfulness. Your word should be your bond. What you say should, be, should match what you do. Otherwise, you, according to Jesus, are a hypocrite. They preach, but they don't practice. Our lives should be lived with such covenant faithfulness that it, gives, it shines a light, the light of God, and gives glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's the ultimate goal, is to shine His glory, the light that they need, people who sit in darkness need to see, and attract them to the God that you serve. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but He didn't stop there. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let people be attracted to God by your light. Let people set their watches and do their measuring and that kind of thing by the covenant faithfulness that you live with your light. You, ladies and gentlemen, are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. If you want to study any more about this, well, there's always February. God bless you richly, New Hope.